Before we get started, I just want to let everyone know that this episode was recorded at Fine Woodworking Live 2019 with some special guests. There are a few edits in the middle just because we stopped to give away some raffle prizes from Lee Valley and Rikon. So I uh, didn't see any point in including that on this rebroadcast. But you do want to stick around to the very end because Vic Teslin might have forgotten that I always get the last word here on Shop Talk Live. But first, here's a quick word from one of our sponsors. This episode of Shop Talk Live is brought to you by Verathane. From furniture and cabinets to floors and crafts, professionals and DIYers alike have trusted the color and protection of Verathane since 1958. Verathane wood stain gives rich, true color in one coat. And Verathane triple thick polyurethane has the durability of three coats in one. Visit verathanemasters.com for details. Oh, that's me. Welcome to Shop Talk Live, live at Fine Woodworking Live, broadcast live on Facebook Live. And that normally gets more laughter. All right. I am your host, Ben Strano, and tonight my co-hosts are Fine Woodworking Editorial Director Tom McKenna. Hi. And Associate Editor Anissa Capsalis. Hello. Capsalis. All of us here at Fine Woodworking are incredibly proud of the caliber of presenters that we've assembled at this year's event. And I think it's safe to say that, er, that there's never been such a concentrated amount of woodworking talent under one roof since Fine Woodworking Live 2018. <laughs> so tonight we're going to give our loyal listeners a reprieve from hearing us droll on about our woodworking misadventures and bring on a few of our Fine Woodworking Live presenters. A who's who's of woodworking rock stars including Nancy Hiller, Christian Bexford and Vic Teslin. But first, as is tradition here at Fine Woodworking Live, we want to welcome our first guest, Joe Taylor, Director of Sales for Rikon, one of the biggest sponsors of this year's event and many others that we've done. Welcome, Joe. Thank you for having me. How's everybody doing? That was amazing how Rod was able to applaud like a whole room full of Absolutely. people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Rod is gushing over there. I need, yeah, I need a fan here. So, yes. Joe, you, uh, you've got a couple of new cool things, one of which I'm, in, I'm very excited about. Yes, we do. We have um, our new DVR bandsaw. Not that one. Uh, no. <laughs> there are a couple other ones, but I don't think... It, I no, can talk uh, about those. No, no. Uh, talk about the new DVR bandsaw. <laughs> so the new DVR bandsaw, uh, we've partnered up with Stray Tech, who developed the technology to uh, to assemble on the bandsaw. And what it does is it, hand, it enhances everybody's experience when using the bandsaw. Being able to maintain torque and performance throughout your entire cutting application with no matter what type of material you're cutting, instead of going out in purchasing another bandsaw, now everything is combined into one with some great features. All right. So I'm going to translate. Yes. Maintain torque and performance. Yes. That means that when you would normally be bogging down your bandsaw mm -hmm. with too much resaw. Yes. The technical. It yep. gets more juice. It gets more <laughs> juice. The motor gears up, and it'll maintain the, the cutting speed for the blade speed and the motor RPMs. Okay. So you're never going to lose power during the entire cutting application. And then the other really cool aspect of that is that you're able to slow the blade down. You can slow the blade down. It, it has um, adjustable variable speeds within each function. The control box that we have, there are four functions. One is for wood, one is for metal, one is for non-ferrous metals, and the fourth one is for plastics. And within each one of those categories, we've predetermined what the optimum speed range is and cutting range is for each material or application that you're doing. For example, with wood, we have a resaw function, there's a bowl blank function, there's a scroll function, and the fourth one is rip crosscut function. That's oh. why I have Rod here. Thank you, Rod. Yeah. Reminds me of all the ones I forget. <laughs> so, so, so you're actually able to, like, even within woodworking, yes. change the function of the bandsaw, the blade speed, for different materials. Correct. And then uh, you still have to choose the proper blade for those applications, but now everything is tied into one. There's no, we take the guesswork out of selecting the proper speed to get their proper performance and the cut out of whatever you're cutting, and it's, it, it's worked out great. Cool. Yeah. 
Now, can we talk about the... We should don't, talk about the... Don't say it. <laughs> Which one? Can we, talk can, we, can we talk about your turning Ready? system? Ooh, our turning system. Well, one of the things that we're doing, we're, you know, we're, we're sliding into... Um, I don't know if sliding is the right word, but Tur turning you'll into. get that maybe later on this year. Um, we've developed additional profiles for our, for our turning system that we have now, the insert cutting tool system, but we've also developed a range of traditional turning tools, gouges, spindles, roughing gouges, uh, parting tools, skews. So we're going to have a whole range of, of individual turning tools that will be available to fit in our system that we have with, um, with the handle, with the quick lock change. So, so like that beefy, <clears throat> long handle. Yes. That, that has a lot of weight, which gives you a lot of control. Yes. You can take out the carbide cutters that you bought with it mm -hmm. and yep. put in a bowl gouge. Put in gouge. a regular, you know, half-inch bowl gouge, a spindle gouge, a parting tool, um, a skew. So we, we have um, prototypes at our booth, so feel free to come and check them out, and then all those will be available in the fourth quarter cool. of uh, this year. So we're really excited about that. So uh, what's the fourth quarter? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Q4, sorry. Um, that's later on Wait, this year. Wait, you're a Patriots fan. You should know yeah, all about the talk. fourth quarter. Yeah, come uh, back. <laughs> um, so that'll be, you know, October, okay. October 1st or okay. sooner. So some of our new profiles that we have, we have what we call a Paisley. We have two Paisley cutters, one for the left, one for the right for doing some inside bowl turning. We have a half moon cutter that's really nice. Um, those will be available within the next 30 days. And we have samples of those too at the booth cool. Cool. that you can awesome. come and check out. So we're excited about that. Um, you know, in the bandsaw category, we just updated our 10 inch bandsaw. Now we have a 10 inch deluxe. So we took all the bells and whistles that were on the 14 inch deluxe and put it in the 10 inch model with spring loaded toolless guides, quick release, improved fence system. So that's. Was and Rod two, chiming know, in again. Rod's showing me two. Two speed. Oh, two yeah. speed. Oh, that's two right. Speed. It's two speed, too. Look at that. It's a good thing we're here, Rod. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See? See what happens when I have half a... Uh... I thought he yeah, was flashing so, so yeah. the The 10 inch deluxe model yes. is two speed. Two speed. Kind of geared towards the maker community. Right? Yes. Yeah. Two speed, half horsepower motor. Um, again, toolless blade guides, improved fence system, and it's just a phenomenal saw. You know, all steel frame construction, real heavy. It, you know, it's not a toy. Nice cast iron table. Because normally, two ten inch saws are like afterthought, not necessarily built like the other saws in a class. But this is a this is this is built to last. I mean, all steel frame construction. Our, our our ten inch model that we had, you know, previous to this is still a live item, and we're very successful with it. We get a lot of end users that use that as their secondary bandsaw. They'll dedicate their larger 14-inch bandsaw to do specific, you know, resawing applications. And then for all their dimensional cutting, they'll use the smaller bandsaw, which is great to have because you don't, you know, you're not going to use it to its fullest capacity. And both of them, you know, pack plenty of power. And updating it to the half horsepower motor, being able to put two speeds on it for cutting in on ferrous metals is it. It was a great choice for. Is us. that one available now? I'm sorry. Is that one available now? That is available now. Yes. All right, cool. Yes. Hey, Joe. I, I have one question to my. Sure. Yeah. Um, I have this weird fascination with manufacturing processes, Ooh. and I was curious if you can talk a little bit about, you know, how Rikon comes up with ideas for products and then goes through the research and development of them and sure. where you do it. And yep. So um, our offices are located in Billerica, Mass. And, you know, the beauty of Rikon is, you know, we're not this, you know, large organization with, you know, a thousand people and 10 engineers. There's, you know, we have 12 people that, that work in the office and there's four of us, myself, Rod, Jack, and David, who... Um, we get information from the woodworking community about what the needs and wants are on certain products and what updates we can make on, on tools. And, um, you know, we take that in, in our offices in Barrica. We have a little area out back where, you know, Rod's always out there, um, you know, changing stuff around, drilling, grinding, and, you know, changing things up to see how things are going to work. Um, we take those ideas, we put them on paper, we have discussions with our factory. Our factory uh, puts them all together and um, we prototype it. They send us the prototype. We go through the prototype probably two or three times. Uh, you know, we go back and forth with our factory through communications, whether it's email, you know, video chat. 
um, or us just sitting down, you know, in a room trying to, you know, pinpoint where all the improvements need to be made with, with, you know, a simple function like a knob. When we were developing the, um, the ten inch bandsaw with the toolless guides, you know, we said, all right, let's make them toolless. We'll put knobs in, but, you know, we'll spend a week because we we go through what every end user goes through with the saw, tilting the table, moving the fence, putting their hands underneath whether they're trying to track a blade, et cetera. And we come up with all these thoughts and say, oh, this isn't going to work. And then again, that goes to the factory. We get we get the samples in, and then once everybody signs off on it, then it goes into production, and we put a launch date together. Cool. So, I mean, we're really excited. There's, you know, we've got some really exciting things happening the fourth quarter, like <laughs> October, um, and November happening this year. So, you know, stay tuned, and I think everything's going to be good. Cool. I wish I could awesome. say more, but I can't. That's all right. I probably could, but I'll get Have it. another beer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, so many good. I hope I answered all those get questions. Him, get I know, him a shot. Yeah, I, I know it was kind of, you know, we bounced around a little bit on it, but d again, um, you know, it's the meeting of the minds when we get yeah. in the office. We have uh, we have a product meeting every week that lasts, you know, sometimes it lasts four hours because we're screaming at each other about, you know, whether it's a knob or a screw or the size of an Allen wrench, you know. Um, but it's, you know, we put a lot of effort and work into it. And, you know, hopefully the end result is good because we see the product out in the market and it's doing well. So great. So uh, what do you have here for people to check out? So we have, um, we have the DVR, the 14-inch DVR bandsaw. We have the, um, the prototype samples of the turning sets with our you know, traditional turning sets with, with the new profiles. And in some of the classes that we're doing, we have two of our larger lathes and one of our 18-inch bandsaws as well. Thank you for And then, oh, uh, we have cordless drills too, believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> and they're here. 12 volt. And they're here. Yeah, nice. 12 volt, you know, lithium ion. Um, lithium ion batteries, ni nice, compact, not that expensive, but great to have around the shop. Good, good workshop. Size. And maybe we'll just give one of those away too today, along with the backpack. So, so if that, you want to do that, we can, we could do that. If you keep me up here longer, I'll give more stuff away. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> more right. beer. Well, yeah, more beer too. More beer. More and beer. Everyone's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just stay there. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody, hang on to the tickets. We're going to do the giveaway at the end. Yes. Um, just so everybody who comes in has a chance. And uh, we've got, I yeah, stole from their it. table. I walked up to Joe. I said, hey, we're going to give away a backpack. Yeah, he was like, OK. Go. Yeah, sure. Um, but we've got the woodworker's backpack, which is awesome. Thank you. And uh, it's got like 412 little nooks and yeah. places to put tools yeah, and stuff like that. So we're going to be giving that away. And uh, Vic is going to help us give away some stuff later on, too. And so everybody, stay tuned. Must be present to win. But uh, thank you for coming on, Joe. Well, thank you for having us, and thank you, Fine Woodworking, and thank you, uh, all you woodworkers out there, for supporting our brand. Yeah. Th thanks, Joe. Thanks, right. Joe. Okay. And uh, next up, we have Nancy Hiller. Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> Give her a round of applause. Nancy, you've been in the magazine a bunch lately. Really? <laughs> <laughs> or there's, we're, this is just there's better, a lot man. of things going on. You guys are working on a couple of things, too. Yeah, we have two more. We are. Yeah. I get, I get things mixed up between what's, what's been... In the works. Yes. Yeah. Right. So... Um, no, the last one was last year. Was it? Last spring. And there was the arts yeah. and crafts cabinet. It was the little, well, aesthetic style. Pre-official arts and crafts. <laughs> okay, Pre official. Getting, yes. Which is going to be here in the the exhibition. Yeah. And oh, if is it? anyone wants yeah. to look at it and critique it, go for it. Just know that that was the one I did for the article. So it was made under the gun on a <laughs> shoot. Under the gun. And so. <coughs> and, and every table saw cut had Anissa going, hold. Pause. Hold. Right. I, and the, the little <laughs> framing miter clamp holes are in it and anyway. she's doing that woodworker thing where she's pointing right. out don't, every don't mistake. look at my mistakes they're everywhere <laughs> don't mistakes. look i just want people to know that if i had had my druthers i would have brought my massive 
Paris Libus reproduction sideboard, because I'm proud of that piece, but that would have required a lot more advance notice and planning and driving than I was able to pull off. So was, you had about a week notice yeah. to bring something. <laughs> was, was, was that the one that was on the cover of Pop? No? Mm, yeah. Yeah. And the cover of my book, the Beautiful English piece. Arts and Crafts yeah. Furniture. Yeah. So, but I should say that Nancy is one of the authors who, when we, when we do a shoot, I, I send them a shot list prior to long before I even go out there. And long? what? Well, no, yeah, long? long-ish <laughs> before I go out there. <laughs> no, Come more on, than that. Manage your expectations. <laughs> <laughs> but Nancy, rather than making um, just props that end up nowhere at, in the end of it, she usually ends up making a completely, she'll make two full pieces instead of one piece and parts of another piece. And this particular shoot, she had one finished already when I got there, and she had one that we put together. That we put together on the shoot. And then she had a third one that was partially taken to a, taken to one, one stage. I don't remember exactly what, but almost finished. So we were able to switch from one to the other. And it just makes everything go so smoothly. And so one of those is really treated more like a prop than a piece of furniture. And I'm kind of quoting Mike Pekovich there. But... You know, it really helps to shoot when somebody's as prepared as Nancy is because you're just, you're moving from one, po is she making faces or something? Yeah. What's going on? <laughs> I don't we all consider are. myself. Here's how I prepare. We're like, by my standards, falling behind. And so I'm in the shop at 5.30, you know, catching up in the morning. I mean... <laughs> after working. Yeah. Anyway. Well, from my view, it seems as though she's super prepared. So <laughs> It's just because I make her good coffee. <laughs> she does make <laughs> She makes really good coffee. <laughs> well, we, uh, we fielded the Shop Talk Live audience for some questions for our guests today. And the first one that came in for Nancy is from Jim. Uh, and let's see, in terms of aesthetic value, is there a line for you between fine furniture and cabinetry? Ooh, that's a good one. Well, it depends on how you define aesthetic value, I think. And I define that broadly. So a lot of people, I think, think of aesthetic value in terms of visual beauty. Um, but aesthetics has to do with all of the senses. And so I would say that um, the aesthetic value has, I mean, a piece of built-in furniture, a kitchen cabinet can have as much aesthetic value in terms of um, touch, you know, being pleasant to touch or frankly, how smoothly the drawers function even. Yeah. There's an aesthetic to that. I mean, even how quiet are the drawers? I've, I had one architect client um, express a preference for one brand of drawer slides, mechanical drawer slides over another, purely on the basis of sound. So that's aesthetic too. Um, I, I don't usually answer either or questions in a straightforward way in case you haven't <laughs> noticed that. And so, and I am also keenly aware that um, among furniture makers, and I was trained to be a traditional furniture maker, there is a, something of a um, ranking of built-ins and kitchen cabinets for sure below that of freestanding furniture. And I rebel against that kind of hierarchy because each type of furniture has its place, I think. So um, have I muddied the water sufficiently or should I go on? I mean, yeah. Well, so so I, I can't draw a line. I won't. I, I'm constitutionally, you know, not able to because I 
it violate to do so would violate the way I see my work, which encompasses both built-ins and freestanding furniture. What would you rather build between the two? I would rather build both because <laughs> <laughs> because I build what, for the most part, I build what people ask me to build because it's my livelihood and I need to make a living. I have... Um, shaped the course of my building and designing career in the slow times primarily by building spec pieces and then pitching articles. And if you or other publications are willing to publish them, that published work enables me to somewhat steer the course of my reputation so that um, with luck, and it's more than luck, it's by planning and design and hard work, people then say, oh, I saw that thing you built for fine woodworking and I loved it, and will you build me one like it, but out of this wood and to these sizes or whatever. And so that's how I've been able, without any kind of real capital backing, to steer the course of my career somewhat. It is very much related to publishers being willing to publish my work. <laughs> well, I, I, I feel the need to promo something else because you had talked about, it's not about luck, it's about hard work and, and planning. If anyone has not been reading uh, our pros corner section of our, our, of our website where Nancy has been absolutely handing anybody who's wanting to go pro or is pro. They've been, she's been handing gold out in the form of like her methodology for um, for working through the process of design with clients, uh, going through things like uh, monthly checklists of like you, you you had one about your Nancy Hiller's reality checklist about the difficult aspects of going pro and the things that things don't pe that people don't think about uh, things you need to ask your insurance agent it's just if anybody out there is wanting to go pro you absolutely need to check out that series because it's a thankless job but you you've been killing it on that front it's not a thankless job to me because <clears throat> this is all stuff i've learned over the years um through the school of hard knocks and it has cost me greatly <laughs> in terms <laughs> of uh, money and angst and sleep so uh, i'm happy to share it i know that some schools have um business components um to their instruction, I can only say that having been through some formal training and then earned my living for most of the last 40 years in a variety of other people's shops and then run my own business, I have learned so much just from a, out of a school setting because there's so much, you learn a lot in a school setting. Schools are invaluable educational opportunities. They offer invaluable opportunities. But uh, there's something about having, being out there on your own. So you may know how to do all kinds of things, but suddenly you're on your own. And it can be a very lonely and frightening place to be from time to time, depending on who is your client at any given moment and depending on other things like the economy. And so I'm happy to be able to offer what I can from my experience to others uh, and hopefully save them some of the angst. Well, we have, we have one more question <clears throat> and I think that this one's gonna, this one's gonna be good too. All right, so this one's from Jeff. If you could only design or build which would it be, Another one and why? Those. And and, and <laughs> we all know that, that there's. <laughs> it's going to be just gonna yes. I'm not going to say either or, right? So we already know that. <laughs> See how she gets to um, not say so, either or. Right. So um, I mean, I would say that in uh, ultimately, my answer is I guess I would be building at this point because. I mean, I've worked for other people where I didn't get to do the design 
and I've worked for myself, and then I've been paid to design stuff for other people. But the brilliant thing about making something is that you get the satisfaction in three dimensions and sensually, you know, it's aesthetic in all senses. You get to touch the wood and smell the wood and feel the wood. And, and you are, I really think that people who make things are in a sense like magicians because they take something that was either just an abstract idea or perhaps a well-formed idea or a two-dimensional drawing and transform it into a three-dimensional useful object that will affect how other people live their daily lives. And so ultimately, I'm afraid it has to be making things in the end, which surprises me, but it's true. Huh. Cool. I'm surprised. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Yay. Well, Nancy you Hiller, you thank you so much. <laughs> Somebody buy her some wine or something. She has earned it. She, she vowed not to drink before going on stage. <laughs> All right, our next guest is Christian Bexford. There he Yay. is. All the way in the back just to scare me. Uh, I'm not going to introduce him. You just did. There's no need for intro. Well, I'm not going to like talk about him. He's Christian freaking Bexford. <laughs> He's going to have to add an F to his uh, company name, CFB. <laughs> I didn't wear my T-shirt. <laughs> Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. If you could uh, just get a little closer to the mic. Thank you. I can do that. You could. Yeah. Anissa will vouch. He, he's a little bit of a nag about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these techie guys. Yeah. Audio he's, quality He hounds me about that. He That's harasses right. me. <clears throat> so um, we fielded a lot of questions for you, Chris. The most important of which was from Scott. And we don't have to do top five, but what are your top five records at the moment? What's that have to do with woodworking? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> well, one of the advantages of working alone is you get to play the music that you like and you get to play it full volume. Yeah. And That's true. To drown out the router and all the other noises. I don't know. I'm pretty eclectic musically. Um, I guess my top band is still the Cowboy Junkies. That's the Mutual Admiration Society. I've built work for them and... I've uh, appreciated their music since they came out of Toronto in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, a lot of oldies, you know, Janis Joplin, Neil Young, uh, some current music, um, Bruce Springsteen, uh, Rodrigo y Gabriela. Um, a lot of classical, too, some jazz, folk, country, Irish. The only thing I don't listen to is hip-hop and opera. If there really is a just God, why is there opera? <laughs> I just people There's with squeaky headline. voices that go. Woo, 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 yeah. Just no, they're not allowed in my shop. Yeah. Other than that, well, now that we've offended the opera community, <laughs> yes, we're, we're hitting a high note. Oh, and yes. Tom again. Oh, the hate mail will come in. They're, they come in threes, people, so watch out. <laughs> We're done? Okay. Nothing else. <laughs> All right, so in the furniture front from Josh, what shaker element do you see reproduced poorly most in modern versions of the, cl of the classics? I, th I think proportion for the most part. Um... People tend to go out and buy three-quarter inch lumber and then use it mm. without taking into account the size of the overall piece. Um, another thing that I think most people don't realize is that most of the Shaker furniture was very understated. You know, people call it simple, but it's not. It's very well built for the most part, the stuff that survives anyway. Um, and what I really like is the fact that it's clean. I'm showing my personal prejudice, but I'm not a gingerbread person. I admire Mike's Kumiko, but finishing that and dusting it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and when you have tusk tenons and you got gingerbread and you got fancy moldings, those are all just dust catchers in my book. 
But that's just my opinion. I grew up with Danish modern. I like smooth, flat surfaces. I like good workmanship, but you don't have to dress it up. Again, that's just my opinion. That's the way I operate my business. So mm -hmm. that's a good woodworking question, though. So, so all right, <clears throat> this, this brings a side question. People use three-quarter inch lumber because that's what's readily available right. to them. Uh, do you think that most of the time they should be using something thicker? If it's a bigger piece, they should yeah. be using thicker. If it's a smaller piece, it needs to get planed down to the appropriate dimension, to proportion. Okay. But there's, like, in shaker furniture, you don't see more five-eighths inch. It's all depending on the piece. So it's all about proportion, like you right. just said. But so I mean, I'm asking you, a stupid question right now, really. You look at the shaker chair. I mean, the uh, the original New England ladder back was pretty stocky. I mean, yeah. they used inch and a half stock for the most parts. And the shakers kept paring it down to an inch and an eighth. And some of the, some of the chair parts are down to an inch. And they've survived for 200 years if you treat them right. Mm -hmm. um, but you can lift those chairs with one finger. So in your house, do you have any shaker originals? Um, I have a shaker sewing basket, and I have a shaker number zero child's rocker oh, wow. for my grandson. Wow. That's it. And, and, and it, was, it was in use? Uh, yeah, it's been used. Nice. It was actually leftovers from parts when uh, Mount Lebanon closed. They had, obviously, chair business was big. Yeah doings there for a while, and they had a lot of parts left over, and Brother Arnold managed to get a hold of some of them, put the chair together, and uh, let me have it. Wow, what a prize. That's awesome. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. Well, all right, so our next question, because of course we have to have a finishing question. Oh, boy. From Eric, what finish are you using on most of your pieces? Polyurethane, oil? Why? Okay. I've written about 80 articles, and 60 of them <laughs> have been project articles. And each one says, the finish I use is oil and varnish. Got that? Oil and varnish. <laughs> oh, varnish and urethane are both oil-based, and you can mix them in whatever proportion you like. You can't do that with, with uh, lacquer you, um, and a couple other finishes. but. Um, by adding oil to a varnish, you're creating what's called a long oil varnish. In other words, it has a larger proportion of oil than, than varnish. Um, the oil is slow to dry. The varnish causes it to dry a little faster and give it a little bit more protection. And to be honest with you, I don't think I've ever used the same finish twice. <laughs> I just want, you know, whatever oil I happen to have, mix them together, see what works. And I've had pieces in my showroom now that have been sitting there for 30 years, and they still look really decent without any touch-up. Um, the advantage, uh, the disadvantage to most spar varnishes, uh, I like to use spar varnish because it's flexible. It's used in the marine industry, and it allows the wood to move a little bit more rather than uh, forming a hard plastic surface. Um, the disadvantage to spar varnish is most of those are made for the marine industry and have UV filters in them. And UV filters are anathema to cherry. The stuff looks like birch after five years. And I like to have it really color in well. And so in the past two years, Epiphanes has come up with an interior spar varnish with no UV filters. So I pour in a little of that. I pour in a little bit of BioShield hard oil. I pour in a little of um, tried and true varnish oil. I and, do. and uh, you know, whatever works. That's the finishing question. Thank you. Whatever works. All right. Yeah. Um, if someone wants a sprayed piece, I will farm it out and, and have it sprayed. That's up to them. Um, I don't recommend things like conversion varnish because that's one of those finishes that dries so hard that you can't repair it. In other words, if you try to refinish it, it doesn't stick to itself. Um, you pretty much have to strip the whole table. Um, when I first started, I built a 24-foot conference table in three sections. And it was a piece that an interior designer designed. <laughs> and, and she wanted two-inch cherry, three separate tables, four feet by eight feet, two-inch thick cherry, and the grain ran side to side, not length, side to side. You talk about wood movement? Anyway, she insisted on a conversion varnish. Okay. 
And she didn't tell me that the legs had to be removable because they had to go to the sixth floor. So they had to hire a crane to lift it up to their landing on the top floor, and they brought it into the... Two years later, I get a call that says, well, we'd like to have these tables refinished. I went and looked at them. They looked like birch. <laughs> and the lawyers had taken their little briefcases with their little brass legs, and they kept sliding. They were scratched to beat them. They were the ugliest things I have ever seen. And I said, I'm sorry. That was the finish you guys recommended. Do whatever you want with them. I can't retake responsibility for a finish that you insisted on having. Um, and so they had to hire another crane. They had to take those tables oh, out of there. Gosh. They had to be stripped. <laughs> you know, if they just said, make the legs removable so we can get them up four flights of stairs, it wouldn't have been a problem. I didn't know that. So there are your finishing horror stories. <laughs> Stick with the oil. It's spot repairable. So... <laughs> How do you feel about birch? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's pretty nice wood. <laughs> you know, but Cherry and I have been together for 50 some years. We're on a first name basis. <laughs> <laughs> what are you working on now? Um, I just finished a king size pencil post bed. Try to talk your customers out of king size because it, especially pencil posts, uh, a queen size looks pretty nice proportionally, but a king size, it looks like a cube. Um, and then you've got a six and a half foot headboard, 16 inches wide. You're going to get some flexing. Um, so that just went, it went into storage. Next is a seven drawer chest. And then I have coming up in May a really nice tiger maple slant top, which I've been dying to do. I've got to get somebody else to do a, a nice dye job and, and probably a shellac finish. Again, that gets farmed out. Okay. Well, that's it. Do you guys have anything? That's it. All right. Well, I, had, I was going to say, when Chris said he was on a first name basis with Cherry, I was going to say, you're going to tie the knot soon. Yeah, I call it Chris. <laughs> Peg, Peg is giving the thumbs down. Peg, Peg Bexford is, is going to be looking for you later. Sorry. Anyway, thanks, Chris. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris. All right, and we've got. Come on, come on. Watch the camera. I should have had a beer set up here. Come on, Vic. All right, now Vic, Vic Teslin, everyone. On floor. Hello. Vic promised he was going to dance, so. Oh, and sing. He said sing yeah, too. Yeah, sing too. I don't so remember. When is that going to happen? <laughs> Not doing it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, so that's what you do, you sing me okay, and then I'm gonna dance. I'm not sure my age. It's getting ugly. Here. All right, we're not gonna tap. We're not gonna tap. I'm I'm not your monkey. So uh, <laughs> should we just get right? Hashtag to I'm not your monkey. <laughs> Don't look that one up, people. <laughs> it ain't pretty. <laughs> it's all pictures of Vic doing weird things. <laughs> And if it's not, it will be. <laughs> we won't even go into your trombone, Ben. Oh, right? Yeah, Ben, you forgot. Oh. And we're back. <laughs> All right. I missed you, Vic. <laughs> what are you working on? His shop. Yeah. Right? Well, thanks, Anissa. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm... Uh, putting together a new shop and, uh, you know, a recent move. And so uh, just trying to get myself organized and trying to, um, you know, you learn a lot when you work in other people's shops and then you you build a couple of shops and, you know, you think you get it all nailed down and then you realize, oh, no, that was a stupid idea. I'm not doing that. And so there's some things that I kept, like putting the flooring, like just the tongue and groove plywood I, I put on the floor. And then I did the same thing on the, on the walls because... Now, if I want to mount a cabinet, um, I can just screw it right to the wall. I don't have to worry about studs. Um, and then also, I have this thing where I take uh, wine corks and I screw those to the walls, and then you can hang a saw on it or whatever. So I try to keep a good um, uh, source of wine corks <laughs> <It's good. laughs> around for that. And I also discovered that many good scotches have corks in them as well. Uh, <laughs> And they're actually better corks, I find. Oh, yeah, yeah. Good. Hey, uh, now, Vic, as a, uh, you're known as the minimalist woodworker, mm. when you moved into your new shop, did you get rid of any tools? 
You know what? I'm a I I don't collect tools. I'm I hate that. I don't understand. I just I always picture that a tool has a soul and then imagine like this thing being stuck on a wall for just people to look at. Mm -hmm. And I just what a horrible way for a tool to spend its day. So um so it anyways, could be in so, my shop. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, and I mean, and that's fine. If you want to collect tools, great. I, I, but I really enjoy using them. And so um, I, I did pair, you know, a little bit of stuff. I, I do a cull every six months. I look to see what has dust on it. Um, and if it has dust on it, I probably haven't used it in a while, and it's probably worth 50 bucks. So, you know, that's uh, halfway to another bottle of Lagavulin. So, <laughs> you know, let's get rid of it. I don't know. Because you got to hang your saws somewhere. Yeah, well, <laughs> you can't just have them on the floor. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Um, have you found, much like I have, that uh, spending time in other people's shops you, you brought up is pretty expensive, too, sometimes? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and in fact... Um, this magazine uh, is a problem uh, <laughs> because there's all these beautiful photos and like everybody's looking at you know what you know what's happening in the center of the shot, but I'm looking all around the shot. Oh, you're one of those. Oh yeah, and I was like, I, when I um, every time it seems like there's a Chris Bexford article. I see the cowboy junkies, and I'm like, ah, yeah, yeah so there's some CanCon in there, you know? <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, I always think that's cool. And I'm like, oh, he likes cowboy junkies. That's really cool. I wonder what the connection is, you know? So, um, but yeah, you see that, like you see, oh, what that, what's that tool and what's that tool? And so that gets, and then I poach ideas for storage, you know, because you're always, as you're, you know, storing your tools, you know, you're trying to be efficient about it. Um, and I, and I even look to other, I don't even know if I'm answering the question anymore. No, it's okay. But um, I even look to other, like, industries. Like, I was down in Australia, and I was at uh, H&T Gordon's shop, the plane maker, um, just looking at his bench and how he has his tools, like, set up so that he can just literally just reach up, grab, do something, grab another one. Like, he's got this sort of like a tray right above his bench, and he just grabs tools, and it's like, that's a really smart idea. You know, so I just poach all those ideas. I, what was the question? I don't remember. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Job done. <laughs> Thank you. Well done. All right. So from Kevin, what aspects of woodworking do you see most newer students totally overthink? Oh, well, there's a lot. There's a lot of things that people get really excited about. And first, like, this shouldn't be stressful, right? This is woodworking. This is the hobby, Right? This is supposed to be fun. Okay? If you want stress, take up golf. <laughs> um, <laughs> with wooden clubs. With wooden clubs. Um, I think the one thing that peop like, people who are new to woodwork, uh, woodworking really focus too much on is um, measurement. Mm. Oh. And I, I was struggling with the words measurement and accuracy because the two are not the same. Um, a lot of times, you know, you'll see a new woodworker, you know, kind of shy away from hand cut joinery because, oh, I don't know that I could saw straight and I'm worried about that. But, you know, they'll come up with some elaborate jig to very dangerously put a piece of wood on and over a table saw blade or something. Um, and I think that, you know, I think part of the problem is, is that, you know, they, you don't want to practice because you'd hate to do that, right? Like, and, and, and become good at something. Um, <laughs> you know, in golf, you just buy that other, the next year's $300 driver and, you know, you'll get another five yards for sure. <laughs> um, and straight. Right, yeah. <laughs> and so, like, for me, I tell people, like, if, if you want to get good at cutting joinery, then cut some joinery. You know, take 15 minutes before your woodworking session, draw a bunch of lines onto a piece of wood, grab a handsaw, and saw to the line. And you'll be amazed that within a week, you'll be cutting incredibly accurately, yeah. and you don't have to worry about it anymore. It's and funny. I'm sorry. It's funny that you mentioned that I, I, it's been a long time since I hand cut a dovetail, and, right. I, and I did it on a project before I did it. I did exactly that. I scribed a bunch of lines and I just cut on some end grain and yeah. it got my muscle memory back like that. Absolutely. And so, but, but you got your <clears throat> muscle memory back. Yeah. Right. Which means that it was there to start with. And so, you know, instead of worrying about buying some jig or fixture or something that you can dial into a thousandth of an inch, if you're working to a thousandth of an inch in woodworking, you're in the wrong 
stratosphere already. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. Thousands of an inches for NASA. Does anybody here work for NASA? <laughs> right. Really? That's cool. Um, <laughs> We got to talk later because I have <laughs> questions. Uh, I am sure the moon landing was made up. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I think that um, I think the biggest thing that you know new woodworkers kind of focus too hard on is the accuracy. You know, like don't worry about measuring the the tenon that goes into the mortise. Cut the mortise and then make the tenon fit it. That's all. Right, you don't have to get the measurements out. You don't have to get the micrometer. Like you should. If how many people here have a micrometer in their tool chest? Nah, you don't need it. Right, you don't need it. It's giving you a false sense of, you know, you always cut joinery referencing one off of the other. Cutting a, a cutting joinery independent of one and the other, and then expecting them to go together is madness. You know, that's when I cut my first pair of dovetails. I was like, oh, okay, oh, I'll cut these, and then. Uh, well, I guess I'll measure them and then I'll transfer these over here and I put them together and guess what? It didn't fit. You know, so don't put that stress on yourself. You know, don't, like with new woodworking, like just enjoy it. You know, make a couple of cutting boards. You know, make something fun. Um, don't try a new skill on, on a project. Like that's madness. You know, you hear about people like, oh yeah, I've never used this finish so I'm going to use it on this project. What? Practice. And that, you know, that's the, that's, to me, that's the biggest thing that they don't do enough of is practice. I've always, I've always wanted the piece to be perfect. Oh, and forget I've, it. I've given up on that. Yeah. Finally, thank God. But it's like, well, especially. Well, I've seen your work, so I would give up on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Listen, you don't invite Vic Tesla on stage if you're not willing to take some every now and then. Man. I it's love been you, ben. Ben's night, <laughs> but but like my especially the first few pieces I made, I just like they, they needed to be perfect because my kids were gonna hand them down. Right, and it's a lot of pressure. The kids don't well, want it. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and now like I finally accepted like oh that dovetail sucked. Well, okay, you know, try harder next time. <laughs> you know? Well, you know, and I think like shop furniture. Like I always tell people. Um, you know, you need shop furniture. You need cabinets in your shop. You need shelves. You need a stool. You need all these things. So don't cut your teeth on something you're going to give to your mother-in-law, right? Well, Because she's going to hate it anyway. <laughs> but, but, you know, cut your teeth on doing something in the shop, you know? Yeah. And if it doesn't turn out, put it in the shop. Right? Like, I'm working on the second of the Minimalist Woodworker books, and so the angle I'm going with is, like, you know, this can be used in your home or it can be used in the shop, depending on how it turns out. <laughs> right? If, it ends, if you yeah. screw up the dovetails and accidentally cut on the wrong side of the line and they're really gappy, don't throw it out. Don't burn it. It's a tray. Right. It's a tray. <laughs> right. Get some veneer. Put the veneer in the gaps. You've learned your lesson. Put it in. Now store planes in it. And now you know when you, every time you look at it, you're like, cut on the right side of the line. <laughs> right? So... You know, that's another thing. Just do that. Don't, don't, I'm going to design, I'm going to build a this, or I'm going to reproduce the Conway chair and then <laughs> try to learn all that. And then, and then it looks like crap. And what are you going to do? I already have three Conway chairs in my shop, so. Right. <laughs> like originals? No. Oh. With, with like, wow. like none. <laughs> like, like none. <laughs> right. All right. So uh, the next question that we have for Vic is, a while ago, you posted. Oh, from sorry, from Steve. A while ago, you posted a video of a tattoo that you have that has leaves representing your favorite woods to work with. For those of us who are crap at identifying tree leaves, what are your favorite woods to build with? Yeah, they got that from the tattoo. Yeah. Wow. Oh, this tattoo. Yes. Oh, thank God. <laughs> was about to get really embarrassing. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> you just saved my life. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So I got this tattoo because, because um, I like tattoos, obviously, but um, 
I, I, there are certain woods that I love working with, and of course, the first one on the on the branch is the is the maple leaf because for obvious reasons, Ooh. if you can't tell by my accent, uh, from hey, Fargo. Um, <laughs> new dude to boot it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, are we filming this? <laughs> Not as far as you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Canadians are nice, remember? <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think that, like, I've got a lot that I work with. I love maple, oak, uh, cherry, walnut, birch, um, pine. Uh, love working with pine. Uh, especially where I used to live up in the Ottawa area, there was a huge tradition of pine furniture. Um, and mostly because there were humongous pines in that area. Uh, when we used to be owned by England, um, we... <laughs> don't laugh, you were too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> we won't get into that. <laughs> um, but the... Um, they had these huge 60-foot pine trees that, you know, got harvested for ship's masts and all that other stuff. So there's a huge tradition for softwood. Um, but I think cherry and walnut are probably my two favorites to work with. Um, you know, uh, cherry, uh, you know, obviously. I mean, it's just, it's gorgeous. Uh, Pennsylvania cherry is like the, is like the best thing in the world. Um, it's... Um, it's up there, like I really like Swiss pear as well, but it's not like one of the ones that I use all the time, but I, I compare Pennsylvania cherry to Swiss pear, because I just feel it's just, it's like that, it's buttery and it's lovely. And we have cherry trees up in Canada, but they're like, they're like Canadians, they're hard, <laughs> you know? <laughs> they're hard to work. Um, so, and then the walnut, I just, you know, really, really dig walnut. I love the smell of it. I love the, the color of it. Um, we have an incredible palette in North America. Yeah. Um, you know, and when you go to places like uh, you go to Europe and you go to Australia, like Australia, like their palette of wood is insane. Like the colors are bananas. Um, I mean, it's not really wood. Um, it's, <laughs> it's stone that grows leaves. Um, <laughs> But it's this really cool, and that's what you notice right away, is the palette's different. You don't see the maples and the cherries and the walnuts and the birch and all that stuff. You see, you know, um, Red River gum and, and Wagga Wagga Garma. And, like, <laughs> I don't know if that's a wood or not. I just, I think I made that up. We get, uh, but, I think you did, too. Yeah. <laughs> but they're just such cool colors, you know, that we're not used to. But, I mean, I think North America, we're so blessed with having really cool that's colored true. woods. You know, so, and they pay, like, down in Australia, like, they'll pay, like, 50 bucks a board foot for, like, walnut and cherry. And I kind of laugh, and I'm like, I get it for 450 <laughs> <laughs> And they, they get really irate. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so I, I think, like, like those, those two, cherry, and, cherry and, and walnut are my two favorites. And then I like throwing in a bit of maple. When I need some white, I throw in some maple or birch. Um, but definitely the walnut and cherry. And are those represented on the ink? Yeah, yeah. Okay. There's uh, uh, maple, uh, oak, cherry, uh, pine. And I, this is and, getting weird. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a hand plane. Really? That, uh, <laughs> that hand plane is actually covering a poorly thought out tattoo idea when I was 18. It was a, it was a, um, a Scorpio, scorpion. <laughs> Because, you know, I'm a Scorpio, so I need a scorpion. <laughs> uh, I was 18. I knew everything. Uh, and then up here is Birch. All right. Yeah, yeah. Good. So I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad it's all there. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I didn't want to know where else it was. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's, <laughs> other, there's other tattoos, but that's Later. different. That's a different <laughs> podcast, Ben. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Oh. 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 Yeah. Oh. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that was Rod from Rikon. I, I, <laughs> I think it's best if we end it here. <laughs> uh, what are what's going on at, at Lee Valley Veritas? What's coming out soon? 
can't tell you that. Yes, you can. Well, no, nope, you won't tell you anyone. Drag Joe through this muck bit. I can't, <laughs> he can't talk. I can't talk. What are you nuts? Well, what has come up recently that Actually, you do want to talk about? <sighs> this sucks we right talk, now. Well, this maybe podcast. Hey, <laughs> I, I, here, here's, a, here's a different question that okay. kind of relates to what I asked Joe. Is yeah. like, you know, I, I know a little bit about your design and, and production process. Do you right. want to? Talk a little bit about how oh, I mean, yeah, you guys sure. really turn new designs out quickly. And right. Yeah. So, I mean, with us, it's interesting because, like, ideas come from a whole bunch of different places. Like, sometimes they'll come from, from folks. People will, you know, send in uh, an idea, you know, like, hey, can you make a this? Or, oh, I mean, I mean I'd really like a that. Um, All right. Hang, so, yeah. hang on one sec. Raise your hands if you honestly don't have a <laughs> 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 Honestly, Rod, lower your hand. <laughs> All right. So, um, and then, uh, like, we have some pretty crackerjack uh, designers, and so we will start to kind of spitball ideas around. Uh, we have an incredible tool collection uh, available uh, at Lee Valley and Veritas because both Mr. Lee and Robin Lee um, really love old tools and they love having that resource for us. So, for example, when we were looking at doing the combination plane, we um, basically drew every type of plow and combination plane that we had, and there was a lot of them. Um, and we play with them and see what worked and what didn't work. You know, one of the most, um, I mean, the, the number 55, you know, a combination plane is a disaster to set up. Right, uh, is yeah, there's just people. How many people here have tried? <laughs> yeah, it's a nightmare. Uh, the 45 only marginally better, um, and so what we didn't want is for the end user to have that level of frustration. And so we started like, how do we fix that? And you know, it was a lot like how, like what Joe was saying. It was like they put their hands on stuff, and they're like, "Is this going to work? Is this knob the right size?" And then, you know, I, I was chuckling the whole time when he was talking about how you're like in a four-hour meeting and you're just screaming at each other because that's what it's like. I mean, it's like, no, that needs to be a knurled knob. You can't have them use a tool and like this. You know, like it's just, a, um, you know. So and then, like, God help you if an engineer's sitting at the table. <laughs> Because then it's like, well, maybe perhaps we could put some sort of, oh, stop. <laughs> stop How many talking. engineers do we have out there? <laughs> <laughs> there go the book sales. But, but the reason I, point, I poke fun at engineers, what makes you so easy to make fun of is what makes you incredible as engineers. And so, um, so we hash all that out. Um, well, that's not the right term. Uh, but anyway, it is in Canada. Uh, it is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, so then we start prototyping. Um, if it's something that doesn't require like a blade in it, sometimes we'll prototype with plastic. Um, recently, we've started prototyping with metal. Uh, with a combo plane, for example, that was absolutely critical because we needed to know how that fence was going to work. We needed to know how the blade support was going to work. We needed to know all that. We couldn't make it out of plastic and then hope. That it, that it worked. Again, the engineers had software that said, oh, well, it should be able to take this amount of load and all that other stuff, but like, what does that even mean, right? Like, to me, I want to, like, run it through wood and see if it vibrates and then creates chatter. That, that little program can't do that for me. Um, and then it's just prototype after prototype after prototype until we think we get it right. Um, you know, then we fuss over handles and we fuss over, you know, what does this shape feel like? Um, and then, then it goes to pre-production, um, and then we produce a, sh a small amount of them, you know, maybe 50 or 100 or so. And that really is as much to prove out the, the manufacturing process as it is to make sure that we're getting good products. And sometimes pre-production, you run something and you realize, oh, oh my goodness, that's not right. And then, you know, you fix those problems. Um, so it's a lot of problem solving, which can be cool and frustrating all at the same time. Uh, but it's no different than designing and building a piece of furniture. You know, like you, you know, you beat your head against the wall a few times to try to figure out what you've done. Um, well, at least that's how I design furniture. And then you put it in the uh, shop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's not like this wonderful experience that I hear other people talking about. It's like, why did I do that? Stupid, stupid, stupid. So, um, <clears throat> what about the financial aspect? Oh, yeah, absolutely, all of that. Like, what's somebody going to pay for it, yeah. right? Like, that's, you know, that's a reality. I mean, there, there are some people who have asked us to build stuff, and it's like, 
you know, for example, like they, everybody wants us to bring back the Tucker Vice, right? If you know, if you if you don't know what the Tucker Vice is, then you obviously um, don't go on to internet forums or anything. But God love you. Um, but um, you know, the Tucker Vice, like it was a fantastic vice. But if we had to remake that today, like you're talking about a thousand dollar vice. And so, like, who's dropping a thousand bucks on a vice? I'm not going to do it, right? Um, I use like an F clamp. Uh, well, that's the whole reason I use a Nicholson is because I can do that. But, um, but I mean, it's so, yeah, that's a huge consideration. You know, what's somebody going to pay for that? And how many people are going to pay for that? You know, you get a lot of people saying, oh, I want a, a circular plane, right, or, a, or, or whatever. And, you know, the circular plane is an interesting tool because in theory it worked really well. It's like cigar shaves, right? Cigar shaves, in theory, it's like, oh, yeah, you can get a really tight curve. And it's like, no, you can't. Have you ever tried to balance the blade and that front of a cigar shave on a surface and then cut consistently? No, not, in, not on your best day. And so it was the same thing with the circular plane. It's like, it doesn't actually create an arc of a circle, right? And so I won't get into the you know, math because I really don't know it, but um, <laughs> that's what our engineers are for. Uh, <laughs> it's more like a parabola. Um, <laughs> But so, yeah, we don't, you know, we don't, um, it, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to do what we hope it does. And then so we're, you know, we're futzing around with it. And anyway, then hopefully, you know, it goes to production. Uh, we hope that we get the numbers right, you know, and say, yeah, let's make, you know, X number of these. Um, but it just seems like, I don't know, it just seems like the more expensive plane we put out there, the more people want it. And so it like kind of goes against all the sort of like, well, oh my God, who's going to buy this, you know, kind of thing. That's how I felt about my first book. I was like, well, just print 10 or 12. I mean, don't, you know, <laughs> who's going to buy this thing? So, um, but yeah, and then it goes, it, it, it hits the market and then, you know, it goes, it releases in North America first and then it goes out, you know, we have distribution in I think 25 or 27 different countries. Wow. Do you um, do you send prototypes or early production models to woodworkers to we do. give you real feedback? Yeah, we do. And we try to pick, like, everybody wants that, right? Like, how many people here would like to be on the list? <laughs> right. But we don't want a fan, yeah. right? Like, we almost went, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Naomi. Uh, um, we almost want to send it to somebody who hates our planes, Right, because you want somebody to, yeah, who put their hand up for that? <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> uh, well, come and talk to me later. Um, but yeah, I mean, we don't want somebody going, oh, it's Veritas, I love it, it's fantastic. Like, that's ridiculous. Like, that's not gonna get us anything, right? We want people to pick it apart. Um, you know, we've worked with a couple of people who are like, you know what, this is dumb, this is stupid, don't do that. Th you know, do this, it's like, it's like, that's what we want. You know, we don't want, you know, happy, We everything's great, because it's not, really. Going back to the early days, did you use tools? The, oh, the April, April 1 tools? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what the status is on that. Yeah, you want, yeah, you want to see the April Fool's tools? Yeah? Okay. All right, well, I believe that does it for this episode of Shop Talk Live. I normally have this part on the script, and I don't, so... Uh, Send us your questions, shoptalk at taunton.com for anyone listening on the airwaves. And thank you. And everyone, thank you for being here. Thank you for coming to Fine Working Live. And we hope you have a blast this weekend. You Thanks. will. Waga Waga Garma. Waga Waga Garma. I don't know if that's a word or not. I just, I think I made that up. Waga Waga Garma. Does anybody here work for NASA? Really? 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 We won't even go into your trombone, Ben. Really? Well, and I've seen your work, so I would give up on it. Really? Oh, this tattoo. Oh, thank God. Really? I thought that was about to get really embarrassing.
Because, you know, I'm a Scorpio, so I need a scorpion. Waka Waka Karma. Scorpion. Waka Waka Karma. Scorpion. Waka Waka Karma. I am sure the moon landing was made up. When we used to be owned by England. Don't laugh, you were too. Waga Waga Garma.